after a nice meal and a nice walk by the lake on a nice California day, I got to thinking about the meaning of life and what it is that makes people feel content or to put it another way, how would one go about avoiding suffering? Freedom from sorrow seems to be a primary goal in Buddhism where the path to liberation from the seemingly unavoidable pain and disappointment in life is allegedly attained through what the Buddha taught as the Four Noble Truths and the Aryan Eightfold Path that leads to awakening. Practically all of the teachings of the Buddha deals in some way or other with this path. He explained it in different ways and in different words to different people according to the stage of their development and their capacity to understand. But the essence of those many teachings documented in Buddhist scriptures are found in the Aryan or Noble Eightfold Path. There's a reason that there are eight categories and they are not meant to be followed and practiced one after the other in a sequential order, but rather all at once, simultaneously, as progress in one category will often translate into a benefit in another category, as they're all linked together and each helps the cultivation of the others. One term often applied to Buddhist philosophy is the middle way, which the Buddhist tradition regards to be the first teaching that the Buddha delivered after his awakening. This middle path does not mean moderation or a compromise between two extremes, but rather it means without entering either of the two extremes. The first spoke on the wheel of the Noble Eightfold Path is right speech. A big part of this, rather than just what you say, is what you don't say. In other words, avoiding wrong speech, refraining from speaking lies, slander, gossip, or rude, harsh, abusive language. The idea is that when one abstains from these forms of wrong and harmful speech, one naturally has to speak the truth, has to use words that are friendly and benevolent, pleasant and gentle, meaningful and useful. One should not speak carelessly. Speech should be at the right time and place. Next is right action, which implies that one should be generally harmless towards all forms of life. Conduct should be moral, honorable, and peaceful. An esoteric aspect of right action is in the context of sexual conduct which relates to Tantra and transmutation, which I've covered in prior videos. Right livelihood means that one should abstain from making one's living through a profession that brings harm to others, like selling harmful toxic items, cheating people in some way, harming animals, and the like. Buddhism is strongly opposed to any kind of war and suggests seeking a profession which is honorable, helpful to others, and ethically noble. These three factors, right speech, right action, and right livelihood, of the Eightfold Path constitute ethical conduct and is considered as the indispensable foundation for all higher spiritual attainments. No spiritual development is possible without this moral basis. Next comes mental discipline, in which are included three other factors of the Eightfold Path, which are right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Right effort is the energetic will. Right mindfulness is to be aware in regards to one's body, emotions, and thoughts, which includes sensual lust. The third and last factor of mental discipline is right concentration, leading to trance-like states, which will have to have its own video. The remaining two factors, right thought and right understanding, constitute wisdom in the Noble Eightfold Path. 
Right thought denotes the thoughts of love and peace, but also of detachment and selflessness. Right understanding is the understanding of things as they are, is seeing a thing in its true nature without name and label. This penetration is possible only when the mind is free from all impurities and is fully developed through meditation and pineal activation through esoteric energetic transmutation. While I only briefly touched on these teachings, they have nothing to do with belief or prayer, worship or ceremony, and so can be compatible with some other religious philosophies as well. This is an ancient path that, while attributed to Gautama, actually predates him in different forms and claims to lead one to complete freedom, feelings of bliss, happiness, and peace through moral, spiritual, and intellectual perfection. That said, the concept of the middle way implies that since pleasure exists, so does its counterpart as suffering. It steers clear of the extremes of sensual indulgence or, quote, indulgence in desirable sense objects. The Buddha taught celibacy, and as I said earlier, the descriptions of the Eightfold Path state that right action includes abstaining from sex, or more specifically from ejaculation, as the energy of arousal is harnessed and transmuted into more subtle forms of what can be considered spiritual or creative energy. Of course, the alchemical practice of sex transmutation is an advanced teaching, which was historically a guarded secret, and so abstinence became the norm in monasteries. One disciple of the Buddha who broke the monastic rule against sex is told he would be better off if he stuck his penis in burning coals or in the mouth of a poisonous snake than in a woman. The Buddha makes it clear that walking the path means letting go of sex eventually, but I'm proposing that this is in the context of expelling the life force energy, as the esoteric techniques which are passed down orally involve what in Sanskrit is called Tantra, which means woven together, as the divine union of God and Goddess is at the heart of ancient Aryan spiritual practices, the act of discovering the deity within by harnessing sexual energy. Male and female polarities come together to become complete. While some modern Buddhist sects will never acknowledge sacred sex practices, I'm referring to the early occult understanding, which is still practiced in some secret societies and mystery schools, and for many centuries was veiled in symbolism as openly disseminating this alchemical knowledge was punishable by death. Today, these ancient esoteric secrets are being disclosed publicly through authors like Samuel Ein Wyor and Taoist master Montauk Chia, who teaches techniques of qi or qi or life force cultivation in Chiang Mai, Thailand. I'll leave a link in the description to a video I did that elaborates on his techniques. For more on the Middle Way, the Aryan Eightfold Path, and the Four Noble Truths, I'd like to play a brief excerpt from a talk by Alan Watts, a British writer and speaker known for interpreting and popularizing Buddhism, Taoism, and Hinduism for a Western audience. The video footage is of a walking tour of some of the most magnificent Buddhist temples in Chiang Mai, Thailand. So I hope you enjoy it. Now then, today, I want to go on to the subject of Buddhism. Buddhism originates in India, somewhere between 6 and 500 BC. 
there is always some conjecture about the exact dating of individuals at this time. But it was during this period that there lived a man called Gotama. And Gotama was the son of a king or perhaps tribal chieftain who lived very close to modern Nepal in the north of India. And Buddha is a title given to this man. It wasn't his proper name, just as Christ is not, as it were, the surname of Jesus, as when we say Jesus Christ, we should correctly say Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Anointed One. And in the same way one should say, not Gotama Buddha, but Gotama the Buddha. For Buddha means an awakened one. A man who woke up, who, in other words, you must understand this term within the whole Hindu tradition, a man who is no longer spellbound by Maya, by the seeming separateness of all the things in this world. That's one of the forms of Maya. And so a Buddha is not a unique historical character. There can be, and it is supposed that there have been, innumerable Buddhas. But the idea of a Buddha is related to the Hindu idea of an avatar, which means an incarnation of the Godhead in human form. Buddhists don't think of a Buddha as an incarnation of the Godhead, because they, although not rejecting the idea of God or gods, relegate all gods to the world of Maya, to the world of relative reality. And in this sense, a Buddha is felt in some way to be superior even to the gods. Let's put it in this way. Perhaps some of you have seen what is a sort of fundamental illustration of the principles of Buddhism, a diagram or map-like thing called the Wheel of Life. And in Tibetan versions of the Wheel of Life, you will notice that the wheel is divided into six realms. And these six realms include human beings, gods, or perhaps angels would be a better term for devas, spirits of wrath called asuras, personifications of the destructive forces of nature, animals, then what are called naraka or purgatories, preta or tormented, frustrated spirits with tiny mouths and immense bellies, having, in other words, immense appetite but very little means of satisfying it. And then again, humans. And the basic idea of Buddhism is that awakening, Buddhahood, can be attained only from the human state. Deliverance from the vicious circle which the wheel represents, life considered as a vicious circle. The gods are too powerful and too happy to concern themselves to be delivered. At the opposite extreme, the people in the Narakas, the tormented souls in purgatory, as it were, are too miserable. The animals too dumb, the Asuras too angry, and the Pretas too frustrated. You can take this wheel, as a matter of fact, not as referring to any actual worlds other than ours of ghosts or gods and purgatories, but you can take these six realms as representing states of the human mind and the human state as representing even-mindedness, what is called in Sanskrit upeksha, equanimity. Now, when it is said then that one can become a Buddha only from the human state, it means, you see, that a Buddha stands above the gods as being released from the wheel. In very popular Buddhism, of course, 
as in popular Hinduism, the idea of the wheel is taken rather literally. It is, in other words, believed that the individual passes from life to life and it's rather funny that although Buddhism actually denies the existence of an individual soul as an enduring reality, nevertheless, in Buddhist countries, it is popularly believed that some sort of equivalent of the soul passes from life to life, and that if the, your present life is miserable, it is a result of foolish actions in the former life. But if in this life you act wisely, your birth in the next life is to be more fortunate, and you may get up, of course, to the heaven worlds, the world of the gods. But human birth is the thing that is always regarded as most fortunate, because you can be tied to the wheel not only by chains of iron, that is to say by acting wrongly, you can also be bound by chains of gold, that is by acting wisely so as to inherit good fruits. Now, of course, very sophisticated Buddhists, not only in modern times but in ancient times, did not take this idea of reincarnation literally. They looked upon it in quite a different way, and just as they regarded the six worlds as states of the human mind, so they regarded reincarnation as something happening in this life. Those of you who've read T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets will remember the passage, perhaps, where he says that those who have just left the platform of a station on a railway train are not those who will arrive at any destination. Those who, in other words, walked in at the door of the room and are now sitting down in chairs are not the same people as those who stepped in at the door. We are, in other words, constantly changing. Just as we know, physiologically speaking, that our bodies are, in all their molecular structure, completely changed every seven years or so, so that we are, as it were, not uh, enduring entities, but rather something like a university where the faculty and the students and the very buildings themselves may change completely within a span of years and yet somehow the university or something uh, by way of a pattern goes on. And so in this sense freedom from reincarnation would be by very sophisticated Buddhists interpreted as freedom from the illusion that the person who came in at the door is the same one now sitting in the chair. And that in its turn signifies freedom from an emotional habit, the habit of grasping at one's own life, at seeking for continuity. And you see the idea of continuity in Buddhist philosophy is that we desire continuity in order to perpetuate our past. In our past, in other words, we have accumulated various things, experiences, material goods, knowledge, virtues, power, so on. And the desire for continuity is the desire for the perpetuation of a past self or string of selves with which we identify ourselves. And Buddhist insight involves the recognition that the past is perpetually vanishing. There really is no past to continue and therefore to cling to it, to identify oneself with it, is to perpetuate an illusion resulting in incessant frustration resulting indeed in that very vicious circle which the symbol of the wheel represents. Now, Gotama made it very easy to summarize his teaching. He was really quite an adept in what we call mnemonics, in putting things in simple form so that they could easily be remembered. And he summed up the whole of his doctrine in what is called 
the fourfold noble truths. And uh, although it becomes sometimes awfully boring to read fundamental texts on Buddhism, which just go over these things again and again, I think it's only boring if one goes over them in the very formal way that these texts adopt. Really, it's a very skillful outline of the nature of Buddhism, and it's based on an old medical formula. In ancient India, as in almost all ancient cultures, every activity was ceremonialized. And when a physician came to pay his call, he gave his diagnosis in a ceremonial way. He made four pronouncements. The first pronouncement was the name of the disease. The second, the cause of the disease. The third, the curability of the disease. Can it be cured? Yes or no? And if it can be cured, the fourth pronouncement is the giving of the prescription. And that's exactly the form of Gotama's summary of his doctrine. He said, in other words, the first principle is that mankind, and indeed all forms of life, suffer from a disease, which is called in Sanskrit dukkha. And the most general translation of that word is suffering. Dukkha means suffering in all its forms. Moral, physical, spiritual. But Western interpreta interpreters of Buddhism have sometimes represented him as saying that life is suffering, period. In other words, of enunciating a highly pessimistic and world-hating doctrine that to be alive is to suffer and that, in other words, the amount of joy, of positive pleasure in life is, after all, so negligible that the game is not worth the candle. Now, if one studies the method of teaching of sages in ancient India, you have to realize that one of their fundamental pedagogical gambits is to arrive at the point of view they wish to inculcate by a zigzag method. When we walk, you know, we put down maybe first the left foot, then we shift to the right foot, then the left foot, then the right foot. And in this way we go along, neither to the left nor to the right, but straight ahead. And you find, too, that in thought, that the human mind tends to go from position to position, but it always, when it settles on any fixed position, we can always point out that that position is an extreme. For example, in scholastic philosophy in the Middle Ages, when St. Thomas Aquinas fastened on the idea that God is fundamentally ends or being, a Buddhist philosopher would point out that he had settled upon an extreme that has an opposite, non-being, and that therefore his position needs to be corrected by the opposite position. Somebody else should get up and say, no, no, God is not being, God is non-being. And from this facing of opposites with each other, we arrive at what Buddhism is sometimes called the middle way. It doesn't mean the compromise position. The middle way is the doctrine of relativity, of showing that all uh, positions or experiences which we can formulate must always be perceived or known by contrast with their opposites. So in other words, Buddha's doctrine that life is fundamentally dukkha, or suffering, is an antithesis directed towards those people who believe that the object of life is to attain sukha, or sweetness, pleasure. He is saying, in other words, you cannot experience pleasure except in reference to non-pleasure. And therefore, the more you pursue pleasure, the more non-pleasure will arise to frustrate you. The more you pursue permanence, the more you will feel the impermanence of things. And so it is, for after all, when we are bent on enjoying ourselves, we become at that very moment curiously aware of how rapidly time is slipping by. 
when on the other hand we are not enjoying ourselves, we become curiously aware of how time is dragging. So then, dukkha, arising from an exaggerated pursuit of sukha, its opposite, becomes the basic characteristic of life. And he goes on to say, in his second principle, that the cause of this is trishna or grasping, sometimes translated desire, and indeed I believe the word trishna does underlie etymologically the English word thirst. But trishna is not quite desire. For example, one's appetite. When you haven't eaten for some time and you get hungry, this is not trishna. It's a perfectly natural occurrence. Trishna is based in turn on avidya, which means unwisdom, which is the way the Tibetan scholar around here, Alex Wayman, likes to translate it. Uh, it's a good translation, unwisdom, or simply lack of insight, lack of consciousness, lack of, well, a special sense of ignorance, not the ordinary sense of ignorance, of not being informed, but ignorance, action based on ignoring something. And ignorance is not realizing the relativity of experiences, not realizing the inseparability of pleasure and pain, existence and non-existence, life and death, up and down, good and bad. So that as a result of such ignorance or unwisdom, people try to separate these opposites from each other, to corral, to gain the good ones, and to exclude and annihilate the bad ones. And as a result of that, because these opposites are exist mutually, they go round in circles. And that mutual existence of these opposites is really, it seems to me, the basic meaning of the doctrine of karma which is involved in Buddhism, the doctrine of conditioned action, which Buddha epitomized in the phrase, this arises, that becomes. In other words, without this on the one hand, or this on the one hand always implies that on the other. Good on the one hand implies bad on the other, and so on and so forth. And so, if a person, uh, a person becomes involved in karma, involved in conditioned action, leading to a vicious circle, if he is ignorant of the interdependence of all states of experience. So then the third truth, the cure of this dukkha or suffering, is the truth about nirvana. Nirvana is the most grossly mistranslated word in all foreign languages, probably, because we are early scholars of Buddhism translated it as annihilation and nowadays nirvana means a state of being doped up to most people. Uh, it's popularly used as being uh, in ecstasy or in a kind of dreamy bliss. And nirvana doesn't mean that at all. It's a state of being very, very wide awake. A state of being completely aware. But the etymology of the word is disputed. There are several etymologies that you can offer, and so I just choose the one I like. And that is to blow out. As when, having tried to hold one's breath, you discover that you can't hold it. You lose your breath by holding it. Therefore, you expire. You despirate. And so, you heave a sigh of relief. And so nirvana is the sigh of relief, the expiration or despiration. Uh, in other words, the giving up of the attempt to clutch at life, to hold it in a fixed form, to resist change, to separate the good side of things from the bad side and annihilate the bad side. It is the giving up of that fundamentally contradictory, self-contradictory, kind of conduct. And so then in the fourth truth there is set out the noble eightfold path Buddha's prescription for dukkha. And the noble eightfold path is really in three divisions one of which concerns itself with 
understanding, might almost say intellectual understanding of the doctrine. The one is concerned with conduct, and the third part of it is concerned with state of consciousness or meditation. Now, to summarize them briefly, one, the, the first stages of the path, such as a right view, or I prefer to translate the word samyak, not so much as right, but as perfect in the Greek sense of telos, or complete. And uh, thus, to have a complete view is a view which does not take sides, which takes the middle path, which in other words does not go off to extremes, and so on. The part of the Eightfold Path that is concerned with conduct. Buddhism is often represented as having a very exalted ethical system. And this is true, in a way it does. But also one must recognize that the difference between Buddhism and Christianity, as at any rate as Christianity is ordinarily taught, is that these ethical ideas are not commandments. They are really forms of expedient conduct. The Buddha counseled his followers to take upon themselves certain obligations, say of not killing, of not stealing, of not exploiting the senses, of not getting drunk or intoxicated with poisons, not lying. Because, not because these were against the will of God or against the fundamental laws of the universe, but because they are inexpedient forms of conduct for a person who wants to wake up. For if you get thoroughly doped up, you're not liable to be very wide awake. And then, finally, the end of the path, the last stages of it, are concerned with one state of consciousness, with being the, the, with the um, process of what is sometimes called meditation, or of bringing one's mind to its maximum awareness through clear recollection. And then, finally, the attainment of what is called samadhi, which means integrated consciousness. Consciousness no longer under the influence of avidya, no longer bamboozled and fooled by the apparent separateness of things which are really inseparably interlinked. And thus samadhi could be called integrated, a unified consciousness in which it is seen that the subject, the knower, is inseparable from the object, the known, that man is inseparable from the totality of life, and so on and so forth. So that samadhi at the end of the Eightfold Path might be described as being the entry to or realization, the making real of the state of nirvana, which constitutes in turn being a Buddha. I hope you enjoyed the scenic beauty of Thailand. They call it the land of smiles, uh, as well as the land of delicious food. And I stopped by at the Spicy Lime again and ordered a Tom Ka Kai, which is a fragrant, rich and creamy coconut milk soup and a Pad Ki Mao, which is flat noodles with shrimp and is usually very spicy. Bon Appetit! My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments, so please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.